Okay, lesson one, how to interpret confusion. Um, have you identified the confusion in our world at this point? Do you, do you sense that there's confusion? What are some, like, just without, let's, and yeah, what, what are some signs of confusion in our land? Mm -hmm. Gender confusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. You know, like the rioting. Mm -hmm. What did you say? Rioting on campuses. Uh huh. Anger. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think anger is probably like a reaction to the discomfort of confusion, because it feels like taking control of something. <clears throat> When you're confused, you don't want to just stay there, so you just try to c control the situation. Like occupational, or like, what do I do with my life? Mm -hmm. Right, spinning, kind of treading water, not knowing which way to go in terms of career, occupation. There's a wave of young men joining Islam. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even like religious yes. confusion, spiritual confusion, not knowing who to believe in, not knowing who to worship. But wanting to be part of something bigger. But, yep. Mm -hmm. I think for me, a sign of confusion is anxiety, mm -hmm. similar to anger. Mm -hmm. You know, when, it, when you're confused for long enough and you don't, you don't foresee things getting clearer, it can cause great anxiety. And we know that that's, that's prevalent too in Gen Z. So there are signs of confusion. There are signs of confusion. And so um, lesson one really comes out of Micah 7. Love this chapter of the Bible because it did shed so much light on the predicament that we are in as a country right now. Um, Micah 7, 2 through 4 has taught me that to think of confusion as a sign of judgment. So let me read to you why I'm saying that. It says, The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. So far, it's just describing evil. So far, we're just talking about people that know exactly what, they're not confused. They want money, they want power, and they're going after it, right? But verse four says, the best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them, a thorn hedge. Here's a judgment. The day of your watchman, of your punishment has come. Now their confusion is at hand. So I've learned to think of confusion as a sign that judgment has come. That there's something about mass widespread confusion that reveals to us that the hand of the Lord has been lifted off and that his guiding light has been removed and that his gracious presence in our consciences, like when he, in Ezekiel, when he perches on the windowsill of the temple and then flies away, has exited. And when God is not here for long enough, we get confused. So just, I need to say this as like a caveat, okay? You're going to hear a little bit about judgment tonight. We're going to get to mercy, okay? But I want you to understand that I'm talking about mass widespread movements of God and this cosmic war that we are in, in which individuals get taken out and in which especially young people get taken out. They're like the small ones in the flock that the wolves go for first. 
Okay, so I don't want you to hear me saying, if someone in your life is confused, it's because God's judgment has come directly against them and that, right? Now, if, if they walk in alienation from God for long enough, then we're gonna see the consequences of that, right? But I don't want you, I don't want you to hear me, I don't want you to take what I'm saying and apply it so directly, okay? It, it does have direct individual effects. And we are all accountable for our individual actions towards God. But what I'm specifically talking about and what these passages are talking about is, is like massive, widespread societal confusion and the judgment of God on a people. Okay? So my, the next few verses in my, Micah 7 have taught me to understand that conf this confusion that comes, that's, that's a sign of judgment. Oh, and I'll say too, like not all confusion is judgment. You could be confused in your life. You could be confused and that doesn't mean God's judgment is against you, right? You understand what I'm saying, right? Okay. Um, so the next few verses have taught me that can, this confusion, this specific kind of spiritual confusion leads to distrust in society and eventual fracture specifically in families and disintegrates the next generation's sense of future. I'll say that again. This confusion that is the result of judgment leads to distrust and eventual family fracture and disintegrates the next generation's sense of future. So that's how the confusion produces punishment. It's like we, we melt down as a society. Look what it says. So let me just back up to that last part of verse four. The day of your watchman of your punishment has come. Now their confusion is at hand. And here's what that looks like. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. So this confusion that is the result of God's judgment, of God's withdrawal from a society, results, we, we will see the effects of that confusion in the family and in the home and in the neighborhood, like in our larger homes as a society. Does this feel at all familiar to you? Have you felt it? against your own family? I felt it against mine. We're doing everything, John and I are doing everything we can to hold together. And it just feels like we are in a tidal wave against us. And what we're feeling is the demonic confusion of our land that we are a part of, that we participate in as a culture because we are cultural beings. We have an iPhone. I don't know if you felt it, like those of you that are my age or older, but like when, when texting started being the way, I, I felt it immediately, like the fracturing. These things have an effect. And, and do you feel it in your neighborhood? Do you feel it at the mall? Do you feel it at school? the distrust, and it's not even so much this like vivid distrust of like, I'm going to get attacked. It's more the, the distrust of, can I say what I'm thinking? Can I speak? Am I, am, is it safe to speak? Side note, if anything I say tonight resonates with you, this, this book has also been in a really important part of my, my learning process. It's called Live Not By Lies. Um, not to be confused with Live No Lies, which is John Mark Comer, I think. This is Rod Dreher. It's excellent. We went to Yellowstone one summer. I read the whole book on the way there. And then I read the whole book again on the way back because it is so relevant, so relevant. So I won't go on any more than that, but I wanted to mention that too because all of this stuff from Micah that God had already been impressing on my heart that I had already been seeing as themes in my conversation with students, this gave me confirmation that I wasn't making this up. Um, okay, and then 
third, the third part of this lesson, how to interpret confusion, is, is found in Micah 7, 7. So the correct response to this confusion, this distrust, this fracture, and this disintegration, the correct response, the biblical response, is to wait in repentance and reliance, not to fix it. It is very difficult to fix confusion. Once a land has been given over to confusion, it is very difficult, if not impossible, other than outside of a miracle, to come in and fix that, that confusion at a societal level. Why? Because it's the result of God withdrawing. So the, it's like, have you ever been in a conversation that's tipped into that direction? And you're like, I need to stop talking because the more I say, the worse this is getting. That's what's starting to happen in our world. And I'm not saying don't say anything. We'll get to that part. I'm just saying don't go storming the gates and thinking that, you know, the old way of doing things, the old way of like of healing society is going to work. If you, if you want my opinion, I don't believe it will anymore. I, I believe we are now at the point where the only thing that will work to heal our land is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm convinced of. When you have young people thinking and doing the things that we see them thinking and doing, you don't get another generation out of that. And so what we need is like the gospel of redemption and resurrection. So the correct response is to wait in repentance and reliance, not to fix it. Here's what Micah says. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. So stay there for a minute on Micah 7 before you turn the page. This is Micah's response. This is a godly, righteous prophet's response to the confusion around him. Notice he's not running out and fixing it. <laughs> he's saying, I will wait. And he's also repenting. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. I mean, the prophet's job is to bring the word of, of um, you know, the law to the people in charge and say, you're sinning against God. And as a result, you need to expect judgment or you need to repent. But usually the prophet isn't the one saying, I've sinned. Although I think any righteous prophet would say, yes, I'm a sinner too. But that's not usually their message. And in this case, he's, he is like representing the people and saying, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. And I think there's something really humbling and very instructive and honestly powerful in this for us. Because as we look around at the confusion, and if you're buying what I'm saying and you're, 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 you're agreeing that this is the sign of judgment that God has withdrawn his favor, he's withdrawn his clarity, he's withdrawn his wisdom, at least to some extent, I don't think it's as bad as it could be. Will it get there? According to this book, it could. So I, I'm not here to predict the future politically, but I mean, when we do see widespread, massive, destructive confusion. I mean, lives have been and are being destroyed. So even if we can still go home at night, have food in the fridge, and go to our church without being persecuted and all that, we have to admit something's going down, right? And so um, for us to say, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him, Where's that coming from? Like, what? What? You know, I'm reading the headlines. I'm seeing this is going on. 
I'm angry at the doctors that are performing these surgeries. I'm angry at the schools that are teaching these ideologies. I'm angry at the rioters because this and that. And you're saying, I have to bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him? And that's what Micah's saying. Part of how we bear the indignation of the Lord is by realizing we're not going to fix this. This is what we're living now. And it's not okay, and it can't continue, but we no longer have the power to change it. And how, we'll, we'll move on in a minute to the next passage, but part of how we've sinned against him, well, let's just, let's go to the next part, because the next lesson comes out of this question, what is it that we're repenting of? Like, we're gathered here in this room because we all agree things aren't right. So there's something righteous inside of you that's brought you here tonight that wants to see a change, right? You didn't expect for me to say, you need to bear the indignation of the Lord because you have sinned against him. And so have I, right? That's not what we like immediately are aware of when we read the headlines. So we need a, we need, that's fair, that's fair, okay? But we need to understand this is what God, this is the trajectory of the Old Testament. This is a thing in God's kingdom. And it's a thing in, in the New Testament too. Peter says, judgment begins with the house of the Lord. Right? So we have to ask the question, what is it that we're repenting of? Okay? And Romans 1 is where I get my answer for that. And there's many other passages to support it, but this is the clearest. Romans 1, 18 through 25 what this passage tells me is that we, corporately, as a society, have chosen, actively pursued worship of the creation rather than God. We have desired creation rather than God. We have relied upon the creation rather than God. Those are all synonyms for worship. To desire something more, to rely upon something more, to pursue something more. We live in the most materialistic, abundant, economically prosperous nation in the world that's ever, as far as what I can hear from historians, has ever been. And we've all agreed to that for several hundred years. And we've all prioritized that and we've all pursued it. Maybe you've been really um, diligent in your, I don't want to, again, I don't want to like bring condemnation where, where that's not fair. But again, we're talking corporately. We're talking as a land, as a people. We've all agreed to this. And frankly, one of the things, I mean, one of the things that's upsetting fine upstanding citizens more than anything else about some of what's going on in our land is that it's threatening our way of life. Well, you just tipped your hand when you said that, right? Because the Bible doesn't promise us this way of life. We've gotten off pretty lucky so far. God has blessed us abundantly in this nation. And that's his choice. But as believers, we've benefited from that. And I believe now is the time he's saying, okay. And are you ready to part ways with that? and come follow me. And so I think part of what we're repenting of, because that's a hard thing, am I right? That's a hard thing to do. Even if you totally believe it, even if you totally want it, even if you've been asking God for it, when that day comes and he says, you're not gonna have a job anymore, you're gonna have to move out of your house now, or whatever it is he says, it's not really what we're going to want. That's natural. That's natural. There's nothing sinful about wanting safety, comfort, a, a nice home for your children. But when we've pursued that and buffered ourselves and done everything in our power to avoid the path of Jesus, and even to say, like even some of our rhetoric in this nation has even denied the path of Jesus. Like God would, God would never ask that of us. 
That's what I'm calling worship of the creation rather than the creator. So let's read Romans, Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So this is telling us that the, the world around us, the creation is, is created, designed, and meant to show us the glory of God and his goodness. So if, I mean, we, it's right that we have been grateful for and enjoying the abundance of the goodness that God has allowed us to live in this country. That should be a reminder of his goodness, right? Because it's his invisible attributes that are revealed through that, right? For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's what usually happens to people that are prosperous. Usually they don't go, wow, this created material world is so full of abundant joy and provision for my life, I thank God for that. I want to give God everything that I am because he is taking such good care of me. Normally, prosperity causes us to worry. It causes us to fret. It causes us to bolster our bank, our bank accounts. It causes us to leave our children and forget about their needs and pursue their comfort and their, you know, their future in the name of abundance. It causes us to have abortions. That's what prosperity has done to us as a land, as a people. It has not caused us to thank God. It has not turned our eyes to his invisible attributes. And that's suppressing the truth of God, right? So 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. If that's not true, I don't know what is. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, man and birds and animals and creeping things. I believe this is, we're seeing this now. I mean, that might feel a little bit disconnected because it's like, well, we're not worshiping idols. We're not, you know, yeah, we're worshiping prosperity. We're worshiping our own comfort, but, we, you know, maybe that verse isn't as relevant. It is. Because guess, what, guess what's been rolling in on the heels of our decades and centuries of prosperity? Witchcraft. Paganism. The very worship of created things. Someone, I mean, I talk to students all the time about this. It's prevalent in the school. Prevalent. This is not weirdo stuff. This is any student that's in our public schools is having to face witchcraft, having to face the presence of witchcraft. Someone just texted me yesterday, can you pray for me? My sister is with three friends and she has books out and, you know, astrology, witchcraft, etc. This is, this is what, this is what's happening. So <laughs> for all of our scientific wisdom, we are now back into paganism. We're back into mysticism. We're back into animism as, as a people. Because that's what happens when you remove God. Then the only source of life out there is the creation, which becomes pretty magical in the absence of God. Like water, wind, fire, trees, a living heartbeat, those things become very mystical and magical apart from God. You put God into the equation, now he's the supernatural thing, and all of these things are just manifestations of his glory. And we know how to appreciate them and enjoy them because he's here. But you remove God, and those things take on a life of their own. We take on a life of our own, and we begin to worship the body right? These are living things that, that you, can't, you can't make a tree. It makes it kind of magical in the eyes of someone who doesn't know God. Does that make sense? That's this. I'm giving you the logic. I'm giving you how we get here. 
It's not just someone like hit the eject button and went crazy. There's a train of thought behind all of this. And we've all been participating in it, even if we didn't know it, and even if we didn't want it. It's the result of materialism. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And if you continue reading in Romans 1, you'll see how the, um, him giving them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, leads to all manner of sexual impurity and other, a long list of other, other just sinful, wretched attitudes and ways of treating one another, not unlike what we just read about in Micah 7. And notice too, just like in Micah 7, where he says, the confusion that you're in is the result of God's judgment for your denial of him. That's what Paul is saying too. He's saying that when he says he gives them up in the lusts of their hearts to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, and later in a verse he says, like, to do what's unnatural with one another, that their women would do what's unnatural with other women, right? So when we start acting in unnatural ways and worshiping, worshiping the, the creature rather than the, the creator, it's a sign that God's confusion is at hand, right? And so these two passages are, are connected to each other. Okay, remember this, we're still in the lesson, what are we repenting of? And after I read this one, we're going to pause and I'll let you make comments, questions, whatever. Um, but the second passage that's been helpful to me for what are we repenting of is 2 Chronicles 7, especially 7.14, which you're probably familiar with. Um, but I'm going to read verses 11 through 15. And this passage tells us that it is God's people who lead the way in repentance and transformation. So we're not the people that sit back and go, how come everyone can't get it right like we're getting it right? No, we're actually the people that say, we understand how we're getting it wrong. We understand what we have all done to get us to this point. That's how God's people lead out of confusion. Okay, so this says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. Pause there. This is a huge moment in Israel's history. Because really they've been working since the promise to Abraham. They've been working towards this moment where God now has a, a place in the land of Canaan where people can come to worship him, where he can be their God and they can be his people. This is like a, a climactic moment. And it says, all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, so Solomon has prayed this big prayer, an offering has been uh, a sacrifice has been offered. It's been accepted. And, and now it's kind of almost like, I think of it almost like the morning after your wedding night or the morning after your graduation. It's like the first day of the rest of your life, right? And here's what God wants Solomon to know on the first day of the rest of Israel's life. He says, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. So he's like, I accept this. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, pause, that's all mosaic language, like Moses language from Deuteronomy and other places where Moses said, when you get into this land and you, 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 know, you guys are dwelling there and all that, if these bad things happen, you will know it's because you've left God. He'll shut up the heavens. There will be pestilence. Like you read Deuteronomy 28, you'll, you'll see this and many more signs of judgment in that chapter that Moses spoke. So God is basically starting the first day. This would be like, you know, the morning after your wedding night, your, your spouse turning to you and saying, when you cheat on me, 
It's like, what? <laughs> oh, right. But I mean, in this case, we know our own hearts. Right? So he says this to Solomon. When I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. So put that in the language of my little parable, right? You wake up on the morning after your wedding night and your spouse turns to you and says, when you cheat on me, if you ask me to come back, I will. That's how committed I am to you. And the natural response would be, oh, oh I would never cheat on you. No, no, you will. The question is not, will you cheat on me? The real question is, will you ask for my forgiveness? Or will you condemn yourself? Or will you condemn and blame someone else? Because the hardest thing to do when you've cheated on your spouse is to ask if you can come back. And so that's what God has to say to them. It's a warning. It's a promise and it's a prophecy. So that's what we're repenting of. And that's why we're repenting. We, we, if, if we claim to be God's people, then we above all people should know how to respond when we see that we've cheated on him. Like the sign that you know you are the people of God is that when you've cheated on him, or when you're a part of a people that has cheated on him, you know the way back. And the way back is repentance. It's a reliance on his grace. It's waiting for him, like Micah said. Does that make sense? So we, we, if, if you want to be a leader of people out of, like I think it says, I think my title was, a roadmap from confusion to love. So if you want to lead people from confusion to love, you need to be the first to understand and to demonstrate and to genuinely do the repenting work. And if we're talking specifically about Gen Z, and, and this is a, one of your own kids or, or a kid that you work with or a kid that you live near or a kid in your church, it's not going to be effective for you to tell them what they're doing wrong or why it's wrong if you also are not demonstrating to them that you know a God who will take wrong people back. If all they're being told is how wrong they are by someone who's completely right, how will they follow you? What are they supposed to follow you towards? Your perfect life? We need to be living out loud in, in our repentance and in our, like in our, our reliance on God's mercy. And that doesn't mean you have to walk around like dejected. It actually means you're walking around joyful and you're not, you're not hiding your journey with God. You're not hiding what God's done for you. And you're not hiding the part where you were wrong. And that's what will heal our land. So I'm going to pause there. Does anyone have any comments or questions? I just want to give like your brains and your souls a minute to swallow. <laughs>